the 12 inch Retina MacBook holds an important place in Apple's history of MacBooks. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this video, but more importantly, this is a buyer's guide. Should you get one? Should you look for one? What do you do if you've got one? We'll find out in this video. Hey everybody, it's Chris from Family Geekery, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Retina MacBooks. Now, if you're a regular of this channel, you know that I love finding uses for older Mac technology, older MacBooks, older MacBook Pros, finding out what they're good for, finding out what they're worth. And if you're not a regular of this channel, then go ahead and like look down here somewhere. There's probably like a subscribe button or something. Go ahead and tap that. But the MacBook, when it came out, this 12-inch Retina MacBook was a very impressive device. Now, you can just look to see how small this is and how skinny it was. There's a lot of technology that went into making it this small. And a lot of the stuff that we take for granted now, like the USB-C ports that this thing has, this is the first device to have that in Apple's lineup. Now, the downside of it was it came out very expensive. These things were a pretty penny when they came out, and I think that's why they weren't as popular as they were. If you're looking at performance per dollar, then this is probably not the device for you. If you're looking for ultimate portability, then that's what this was made for. So previous to this lineup, we had the original MacBooks, which ended in 2010. So it was five years until we had this MacBook, because these were out in 2015, 16, and 17. Only three years, but it served as a very important bridge in between some of Apple's older laptops and some of their more modern ones. So obviously between 2010 and 2015, Apple was selling a ton of MacBook Airs. And they were the perfect laptop for someone who wanted an Apple product, but didn't want to pay the MacBook Pro prices. And we've looked at those MacBook Airs on this channel. In fact, there's a buyer's guide for the 2015 model that you can check out. I'll go ahead and link that up here. But these MacBooks introduced the Retina screen to the smaller laptops. It wasn't until 2018, after they stopped making these MacBooks, that we got a Retina screen on a MacBook Air. And since we're talking about MacBook Airs, let's go ahead and take a look real quick at a comparison between what would have been the 11-inch MacBook Air and the 12-inch MacBook. So look at this difference. Not only is it quite a bit smaller, but it's much thinner and lighter. So you can see about an inch difference in width, despite the fact that this is a larger screen. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying that this was a very impressive device at the time. Smaller body, bigger screen, much better screen because it was Retina. But then again, they were kind of expensive and the performance wasn't super to start with. So let's talk about a little bit about the performance. So like I said, they made these in 2015, 16, and 17. And if you look at them from the outside, you're not going to tell any difference at all between them. But using my handy dandy Mac Tracker app that I'm always talking about, you can see where these line up here. And if we look at the processors, you can see we used in the first one here an Intel Core M. And that's some, uh, some funky numberings that is not familiar to me being a PC Intel builder. But they're obviously very small, low power processors for putting into laptops. And the performance, like I said, was not very good. If we go fast forward up to 2016, then we can see we started having what they called the M3, the M5, and the M7. So those would be equivalent to, you know, the i3, i5, i and i7, but in the mobile world. So a very small processor. And we can see the speeds here, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 gigahertz. So it's still not very fast. But by the time we get to 2017, they were actually using the M3 still, but then on the more expensive models, an i5 and an i7. Still low processor speeds, still just two cores, but they were a little bit faster. And we can see the benchmarks here. They grow up each time they go further in a year. The jump between 2015 and 16 is not very big, but the jump between 2016 and this 2017 model was pretty decent. Now, obviously, in addition to the processor, all of your RAM and all of your SSD is all built on the board itself, so no real upgrades there. Luckily, most of the models started with 8 gigabytes of RAM, and probably just about every one that you would find out there would be an 8 gig model. I think there was some 16 gig models in the newer models, but you can pretty much bank on the fact that if you find one of these out in the wild, it's going to be an 8 gig model. And when I said the price per performance was pretty low on these, you can see that all three years, 
they had a 1299 model and a 1599 model and then as you go up in processor speed and up in RAM on the newer models then it would get even higher than that so entry level 1299 is a pretty penny for these compared to maybe what you could get today for you know around a thousand bucks for a really nice MacBook Air with an M2 or M3 processor even. So knowing that these things didn't have a ton of performance even when they were brand new, what can we expect to run on them today? Now you're limited by the OS depending on which model you have. If you've got a 2015 it's good all the way up to Mac OS 11 or Big Sur. If you've got the 2016 that's capable of running up to Mac OS 12 or Monterey. And then if you're lucky enough to find one of the 2017s, it'll upgrade all the way up to Mac OS 13 or Ventura. Now, does that mean that if you're running one of the older ones that you have to be concerned about security patches and stuff like that? Well, eventually, yes. I would say you're still pretty safe running Big Sur on one of these. That's going to be just fine security patch wise. But eventually that is going to be a problem. So if you compare the performance of these to the MacBook Airs at the same time, the 2015, they're going to be very similar. The Air is going to be faster, obviously. And then in 2017 models, same thing. The Air is going to be still faster than this MacBook. And then it's going to be much more pronounced once you get into 2018 and above. Those MacBook Airs were going a lot faster than these MacBooks were. So now we know a little bit about the history and performance. Let's talk about what to look for if you find one of these and maybe you want to pick one up. So we're looking right here at a 2016 and this is the 1.2 gigahertz M5 so it's a little bit upgraded from the base model still 8 gigs of RAM and this one does have 500 gigabytes of SSD so this was a pretty good find because it's not the very bottom model it's not the 2015 model so it's got some upgrades to it. It's right there in the middle of the lineup as far as 2015 to 2017. And I can tell you that this is pretty much the ultimate couch laptop. Like if I just wanted to do some surfing and I'm sitting on the couch and I don't want something super heavy on my lap, this thing is awesome. Now things to look out for, obviously this introduced us to the butterfly keyboard style. You either love it or hate it. As long as all the keys work, it's still fine. It's not my favorite keyboard in the world, but they had to make them pretty small because you saw how thin this thing was. You're not going to have a full size, you know, really nice squishy button keyboard with it. It's going to be a very flat keyboard feel. But I haven't seen as many problems with these keyboards versus the ones in the early 2017 and 16 modeled MacBook Pros that had the problem with dust getting underneath them. These have all been pretty decent. So you've got a really nice display, a retina display with 2304 by 1440 resolution. Basically very similar to a 720 uh, resolution, but just with twice as many pixels. So it's going to look a lot crisper for you. And with this retina display, you even have some options through the OS to change what the resolution is. So if you go into the display properties and switch to scaled, you can see you've got four choices here on how big the desktop's going to be. You either go all the way over here to larger text where you can have less pixels and less real estate or all the way over here to more space where the words are going to get smaller but you're going to have more room for whatever it is that you're doing on the screen. So if you're looking at these and you find some for sale and you're wondering if you should get one of these or one of the newer MacBook Pros or one of the newer MacBook Airs then you got to really think about your use case. Do you want ultra portability and you don't need super performance, then yeah, this is still a great laptop. Now, I would definitely go for the 2017 versus the 2015, and if you can find one with the higher processor in it, that'd be great too. But if you don't need the performance, then like I said, this thing is great, super portable. It's just fun to use. Now, depending on what prices you find these for, you have to be careful because you can get a really nice MacBook Air for really cheap on the used market. So the problem with that is, Anybody that bought one of these and paid a buttload of money for it is probably going to try to get a lot of money back out of it. And on a lot of Mac products, they hold their value pretty well. But you got to remember, you got to compare this up against, like I said, like a 2020 MacBook Air would run circles around this thing. And you can pick those up fairly cheap these days. So be careful what you're looking at spending wise on one of these MacBooks 
you got to compare it against all the other things that are out there. So what should you expect to pay for one of these things? Now, I always hate giving out prices because that's going to obviously vary on when you're watching this, you know, today versus a year from now. And it's also going to vary on your local used market. If you're in an area that has a lot of turnover of this kind of stuff, you might be able to get it cheaper. If you're in an area that doesn't have a lot, then people may be asking more for it. But just to give you a ballpark price of what I'm seeing, like perhaps on eBay even, if you find one of these, like the 2016, in a poor condition, like functioning good but maybe dinged up a little bit, you can probably find those in the $200 area. If you find one of these that's in a pretty good condition, maybe like this one here, then you can find those in about the, the higher twos to even $300. So use that as a ballpark to either scale back to the 2015 or go forward to the 2017. Use that as a ballpark to scale up and down between like the M3, the M5, and the M7 processors. And then obviously the uh, storage as well. I'm not super concerned about storage on something like this because you're probably not editing videos. You're probably not editing photos on it. You're probably not storing a lot on it. Save everything in the cloud. Get yourself a nice USB-C external exposure, maybe something like this with an NVMe drive in it to store any kind of data that you might need because you got that super fast USB-C port on there and don't worry too much about the size of the hard drive. Now when you do find one and it's at the price point that you want, go ahead and check everything out on it. You know, check the outer casing, look for any kind of dents or dings, check the screen out, look for any kind of scratches or any kind of cracks. Uh, you may see them chipped up in the corners here. You may see them, you know, someone closed the lid down on it and you might see like a, a ripple along the sides on the, one of these. So look for that kind of stuff. Um, take a quick second and open up like a notepad and run through all the keys just to make sure. Even though these were better than some of the other keyboards that Apple's made, you still want to make sure that there's no problems with the keyboard itself. And then check out the battery also. If we go into the system report and you go over to power, Look at the cycle count. The cycle count doesn't tell you everything, but it does tell you a lot. Um, these things are probably rated for a thousand battery cycles. You can see this one is showing about 138, but definitely make sure that the cycle condition or the battery condition is normal and not something that says like need service or service soon. I've got a whole video on how to figure out if your battery is good or bad. I'll go ahead and link that one up there too. But yeah, just do a full physical look at it, do a little bit in here, just to make sure that everything looks pretty good before you shell out any money for it. If you can, go ahead and turn on the Wi-Fi, try to connect to Wi-Fi hotspot, wherever it is that you're testing it out. See if you can play a video on YouTube or something and check out the speakers. Just all the kind of normal due diligence that you do when you're buying a laptop. And then one other thing I'd check is the power supply that comes with it. Make sure that the USB-C cable when you plug it in here, it's got a nice solid feel to it. And when you plug it in, see that it's charging up top here. And then do a slight little wiggle on it. Make sure that it doesn't cut off and, and stop charging. Because I've seen some of these USB-C ports where someone has their cable in there and maybe the cable's being bent by, you know, whatever they're sitting on or they're sitting it on their lap or something. And it starts to, like, widen out this port enough that a USB-C cable just doesn't plug in there nice and firm. So make sure that's got a good solid contact because that would be very hard or very expensive to repair if you needed to. And speaking of power supplies, the good thing about this is since it has USB-C charging, if you find one of these either without a power supply or you find one that the power supply is all beat up or chewed up, then don't fret too much about that because you can get a replacement for pretty cheap since it's USB-C. It only took 29 watts, so even something like this tiny little anchor here, this is a 65 watt, you'll be able to charge your MacBook, your phone, your tablet all at once, and you're not going to break the bank. So I'll leave some links down below for charging accessories for something like this. You can even run it off a battery. So just to kind of summarize everything I've said, if you're looking for something super portable, you don't need a ton of performance, then yeah, go find one of these for cheap. It's going to be a great little machine for you. If you need more power, if you're willing to spend a little bit more money, I'd say go ahead and find a MacBook Air that's either 2018 or newer, and that's going to give you a little bit more runway in life as far as security patches and that kind of stuff.
But let me know what kind of questions you might have about this. Go ahead and throw them down in the comments below and I'll be happy to answer as many as I can. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped you out somewhat. If it did, I appreciate that thumbs up. Like I said, go ahead and check out the rest of the channel. See what I've got going on there. Maybe hit that subscribe button too. That's going to wrap up this video. I thank you as always for watching. And until next time, peace out and geek out.